All right, well, hello everybody. Welcome back to Coffee with Keener. This is episode four. Um, we are flipping through Philippians. We're glad you're uh, joining us. So how's everybody doing? Dr. Keener's in the house. Hey man, how you doing? Doing good. Uh, what kind of mug we got today? Well, it says uh, pastor on it. Uh, All it's, right. uh, yeah, back when I was lead pastor uh, at my last church, somebody got a pastor mug for me. That was nice. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I got actually my wife and sister-in-law dressed as Japanese geisha girls. They, <laughs> they just have a Jap. This was in Japan. They have like a Jap. Their grandmother was Japanese, so it's pretty sweet. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, no, no, we're excited you guys are with us. If you've missed something, if you want to get plugged in, link is in the description below to our uh, playlist on our Hope's YouTube channel. So, you know, please jump in there. And uh, our email is coffeewithkeener at gmail.com. If you have any deep questions to throw in, we'll get to that at the end of the episode. But please, you know, keep throwing those towards us or any feedback or anything. You know, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. But... Today, we're talking about something big, right, Dr. Keener? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Some really good stuff. So, and just to recap, we went through verses 7 through 10 last time, and we just kind of talked about this idea. Paul re kept reiterating his love for these people of Philippi, um, and, and Dr. Keener gave us the links of love, yeah. his <laughs> which was, first, God loves us, then we love God, then we love ourselves. And then we love others. The links I had a four links in the chain of love, brother. Four links in the chain of love. Yeah. And, then the last, and then the last thing that we talked about was Paul was praying for them to have insight and understanding. And, and the goal of that was so they could discern God's will for them and be pure and blameless, you know, unashamed mm -hmm. in front of God. So Paul really just, again, emphasizing his love for these people, his Christ-like love for them. And uh, so we learned a lot there. So that was super cool. So today we're going to keep moving through Philippians, starting with verse 11. We're going to touch that for a little bit, and then we're going to spend some time on uh, verse 12. So you ready to dig in? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. So let's go Philippians 1, verse 11. All right. So it says... So this is just coming off of discerning what is best, pure and blameless. That was verse 10. And then it says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Mm -hmm. So this fruit of righteousness, you know, I, I think some people have heard this and I know another term fruit of the spirit, right? Yeah. Um, so, so what is this? Let's talk about what this fruit is, how we produce it. And then and really like, why, why is it important for us as Christians to, you know, have this fruit, you know, let's kind of unpack that a little bit. Yeah, this fruit, uh, you know, it's, it's really what God wants to see in our lives. Yeah. Um, and it's both a character trait, kind of who we are and mm -hmm. behavior as well. Okay. Because, who we are eventually uh, determines what we do. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so this fruit of righteousness, good fruit, right fruit, uh, you know, behavior that will be right on with God, if you will. This, this is really what okay. God is looking for in our lives. And Paul calls it the fruit of righteousness in this verse. And, and, and as you noted elsewhere, uh, specifically in Galatians chapter 5, uh, Verses yep. 22 and 23, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe you want to read that, that verse. Yeah, so Galatians 5, Galatians 22. 5, 22 and 23. So it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Wow. I mean, that's some pretty good fruit, right? Yeah, so he lists out some really, really great qualities in, of a person. And, and really, Jesus had all this fruit in his life, and, and he did all this stuff perfectly. So, so he's our model. I mean, he, he's our example. Yeah. We haven't gotten there yet. I mean, if you look at that list, I'm sure 
uh, you could and I could come yeah. up with something. Hey, we're, we're not there yet in that particular thing. So we're, we're a work in progress. Yeah. Um, there might be one or two of them. Yeah, we may be. One more. Yeah, yeah. So we're all working on these, and hopefully yeah. we are noticing improvement in our lives. That, that's, that's what we're after. We're working yeah. toward the goal. The goal is to be like Jesus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like this constant, like, yeah, keep, continue going, continue working on all of these, you know, looking yep. back and realizing, hey, I've made progress is a good thing, but not stopping, continuing to go. Yeah, and it's important that we have these things in our life because um, we're, we're told that, that people will know that we are disciples of Jesus by the things that we do, by the life that we live. So people are watching yeah. us. And yeah. we need to demonstrate these things in our lives. Uh, we need to do our best to be like yeah. Jesus because people are watching. Yeah, that's why this is so important, right? Because yeah. it's, it's almost a way to show others Jesus. Yeah, that we're followers of Jesus. And, yeah. uh, and another thing that comes out of this that's important as well uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 5, 16. This is what he says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So when you're mm. living this kind of life, the, the Christ-like life before others, uh, you're actually giving glory and praise to the Father in heaven as well. So, so yeah. it's, it's really good stuff. We need to make sure that uh, yeah, this fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the spirit is evident in our lives. Yeah. And I mean, and all those, those qualities we listed are just, you know, ones that everybody knows, you know, mm -hmm. love, patience, self-control. So I think it's super relatable. Um, so cool. So that's the fruit yeah. of the spirit. So we want to produce that so people can see that. And then it also brings glory to God. So it's a twofold win-win situation. Yep. It's a lifelong, uh, challenge really we're yeah. still we're still working on a man we haven't arrived oh, yeah like you said we'll, we'll we'll always be continuing to strive towards that yep cool so that's verse 11 we just touched on that uh verse 12 let me read that and then we'll we'll dive in there a little bit so this is you know paul now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So we wanted to take a time really to stop here, guys, and really talk about the gospel. Um, we, we've mentioned before, Paul kind of picked it up. And, you know, in all of our studies and episodes after this, I'm sure it's going to come up a lot. So we really wanted to take the time to talk about, you know, what does gospel mean? What does that word mean? What, what's this message that Paul talks about or that you hear in general, you know, what's this all about? And then really, what does it mean for us? So we're just going to walk through that because um, we think that's extremely important. And it, it's, some, it's something that means something for everybody. And so, so let's start with the word gospel. Let's start from the roots, Dr. Keener. What, what does gospel mean? Where does that derive from? Let's start there. Okay, the word gospel is a translation of the Greek word evangelion. evangelion. And, and it means good news, good news. It's interesting okay. that word uh, evangelion, you see maybe an English word evangelize or uh, yeah. evangelicals. We are evangelicals, meaning that our, our primary motive and task is to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Okay. That's where our name evangelical comes from. So, so the gospel is good news. Um, and, and it's good news of great joy for all people. This just isn't a local message or a regional yeah. message. This is a world message. It's not, Everybody's, for, it's not yep. for one church or another nope. church or, or even people who don't go to church. This is, this is for everybody. Every nation, every tongue, every people, man. It's for everyone. Yeah, now, that's why it's so big. That's why it's so big. Big, big. So it's good news. Now, now all right, so what is this good news? In a, 
in a very general sense, we could say that all of the Bible is good news because it's God's word. If it's God's word, yeah. it's good stuff. It's good news. But that's in a general sense. To be more specific, um, the best good news. The best is good the, news. The best good news is how I like to talk about it. Not just yeah. good news, man. This is the the best good news. And the best news of all is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus. Yeah. So so what is this gospel? Or what yeah. is this good news exactly? How can we kind of put this yeah, in a nice taking, little package? Yeah. yeah, we're taking gospel, which means good news, and now we're applying it strictly to Jesus. Yeah, so what's the good news of Jesus? Like, what's this gospel message Paul talks about? Well, it's talked about throughout the New Testament, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but there's no question in my mind, the best definition, the clearest definition of the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. So it would be good for us to just yeah. uh, take a look at that quickly. We don't have to really well, – we're going to talk about it pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, let's take a look at this. 1 Corinthians uh, – I want to just look at verses 1 and 2 uh, – first and then we'll we'll jump into three and four uh, all right so i'll read that first corinthians 15 1 and 2 so it says now brothers and sisters i want to remind you of the gospel i preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand okay By let me just gospel. stop you there vince hold on okay. a second uh they received it in other words they accepted it yeah as truth all right, and then it says that on which you have taken a stand. So in other words, they were standing firmly on this truth, trusting mm. uh, in what this truth said, and namely, the subject of this truth, uh, none other than Jesus Himself. So it's it's both a message and a person that we're talking about, the Lord Jesus here. Yeah. So let, let's keep going. Okay. All right, verse 2. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Yeah, so by this gospel, this is why it's good news. It says, by this gospel, you are saved. Yeah. Okay? Uh so this gospel message uh, is, a, is a message that can save. That's the good news. Okay. But there is a, a condition, Paul says, if you hold firmly to this word I preach to you. So, so here, Paul is clearly talking about uh, an ongoing belief and trust in Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so this so, message, this message is personal for us. Like, oh yeah, this means something for us. If if we're mm -hmm. accepting Christ and accepting this message, it's it's saving us. It has that power. Yeah. So, that's a little bit about the message. What exactly is this message then? Let, let let's kind of break this down, get it right yeah. down, let's get and make points. it very clear. And, and that's where we need to go to verses three and four here. Paul tells us exactly what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. All right, I'll read that. It says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Yeah, so there it is, there man. It is. Christ died, was buried, and was raised on the third day. That's the gospel. It's the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's a really concise way of looking at the events of the gospel message. Super cool. Yeah, the gospel in a nutshell. There it is, man. There it is. So yeah. I, have some I have some questions. 
Okay. Looking at that, Christ died, buried, and raised. All right. So, first, I guess, why Jesus? Why? Why, why does Jesus? Why is he the one to die for this? Why couldn't some other? You know, there's lots of people in the Bible, right? There's lots yeah. of prophets. You know, Paul, for example. Yeah. People held to really high Christian, you know, esteems in the Bible. Um, that lived good lives, you know what I mean? That that lived, you know, godly lives. And why couldn't one of them? Because a lot of people in the Bible, in the New, a lot of people died for this cause. Why couldn't they, you know, do what Jesus did? Well, the person who uh, qualified to die for the sins of the world had to live a perfect life life hmm. and that's what sets jesus apart from uh yeah. everybody else so he, he had to be a perfect sacrifice it's interesting the old testament uh lambs had to be perfect without spot or blemish you know to, to, yeah. to qualify as sacrifices so so the same thing held true of the ultimate sacrifice jesus he had to be perfect uh, and no other yeah. person that's ever lived on the planet yeah. uh, qualified to do that. Uh, yeah, even all these, the, yeah, go ahead. Even all these guys, yeah, that we just were talking about, yeah, no one lived the perfect life. Yeah. So this, this perfect life was, was needed for this sacrifice for all of us. Yeah, Christ had to do what Adam, the first man, failed to do. Now, here's why that's important. And Paul yeah. talks about this. Maybe you want to look this does, up real yeah. quick. Romans 5, 18 and 19. Now, before we read those, let me just set the stage here. Uh, and Paul, set this is stage. what Paul... Set the stage. Here we set go. Set the stage, Doc. Yeah. Uh, we're going to learn here that Adam's disobedience, his sin brought death. Mm. Christ's obedience. Uh, gives us life. It brings life. Uh, okay. so, so let's both spiritual and physical. Uh, okay. So we'll talk about that, uh, but read those verses. But Romans 5, 18 and 19. All right. It says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. So it's kind of this like flip. Yeah. One guy does wrong and everybody suffers. Yes. One guy, one guy does right and everybody is given life. Amen. Super the cool. Sin brought death. Christ's perfect sacrifice brought life. Brought life. Yeah. So it is. A flip. One guy messed things up, yeah. and one guy fixed things up. Yeah. And, and, and I often hear, oh, man, it's not fair that we have to suffer because of Adam's sin. You know, the reality is if that would have been us, we'd have done the same thing. We would have disobeyed mm -hmm. God as well. But, but yeah. God's fair. He allowed, you know, one sinful act screwed things up for us. Mm -hmm. One sacrificial act fixed things up for us. Uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, Which is really cool because I know we've talked about love before and this idea that love has this action attached of giving and the yeah. idea that not only God, you know, gave his son, like we learned in, you know, John three sixteen, but then Jesus gave his life. This, this, this giving action is always associated with this godly love, which is kind of cool. We see that kind of, you know, sewn into the scripture here. Now you could say, all right, Jesus lived the perfect life. That's, that's great. Yeah. But why did he have to die? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that people have asked me that question. And it all has to do with, with a law that God has established. Uh, and this is it. Um, uh, this is God's plan 
This is a law he has established, and it's found in Hebrews 9.22. Hebrews 9.22. Okay. You want me to read that? Yeah. All right. Hebrews 9.22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So there it is. Yeah. In order for God to forgive sin, blood, some kind of blood, has to be shed. That's yeah. the law of God. I, I don't, you know, <laughs> yeah. That's I didn't not... write the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, th this think... is what yeah. God has established as law. Well, it um, makes me think about, you know, we, we brought up the Old Testament and just this idea, and, I, and I've had these discussions with people. Um, in the Old Testament, you know, sacrificing, you talked about the lamb, you know, I, I think, all right, now Jesus comes and kind of, you know, they allude to him being a lamb. So what's this, like, why aren't we still sacrificing animals? You know, why, okay. you know, it seemed like they kept doing that, but Jesus died and now there's none more happening. So can you touch on that a bit? Yeah, yeah. This, this whole idea of sacrificing animals and a sacrificial system yeah. It was actually established by God back uh, with Adam and Eve already. Mm -hmm. uh, if we turn to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. Uh, oh, man. A couple, yeah, a couple of verses we want to look at here. Uh, God actually told Adam in Genesis chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17. This is what God said to Adam. I'll let you do every, anything you want to do here on, in this Garden of Eden. But there's yeah. one thing. This one thing one you can't thing. do. Come one on, thing. And Come God, on, man. Yeah. And God warned Adam. He said, listen, if, if you do this, if you disobey me and do this, you're going to die. Yeah. So we know what happens. Adam disobeys God. Um, and God had every right at that point to, to physically kill Adam. Mm -hmm. but, but here's where God demonstrates his love for the human race. Right? Yeah. Rather than kill Adam... God killed an animal instead and sacrificed mm. that animal for Adam's sin. Now that's implied uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. It okay. doesn't come right out and say that, but you got to read between the lines here. If you look at Genesis 3, 21, we're told that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So we made garments of sin. Uh, how? Uh, all right, there's the phone. We got to kind of. <laughs> did you hear the no, phone? Keep, yeah. Yeah, we'll keep, keep going. going. So God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. Where did he get those garments, those animal skins? Animals. We're not, yeah, we're not told, but I would yeah. think from. An animal or animals. So here's what I think happened. I believe God actually showed Adam uh, how to sacrifice for sin here. Uh, okay. That he, he told Adam that in order for sin to be forgiven, blood has to be shed. Hmm. And I think he also instructed Adam from that point forward to continue to make these same sacrifices for sin. Now... That was practiced, I believe, from that time forward. It became yeah. official law uh, for the people of Israel through Moses. Moses, yeah. Uh, so, back to your question. These animal sacrifices temporarily satisfied God's law. And that's why they had to be uh, repeated again and again. They Here's a key point point to understand uh, the Old Testament sacrifice. Uh, 
these animal sacrifices covered sin, temporarily satisfying God's demand, but they could not, did not, never took away sin. Okay, so temporarily. Temporarily satisfy God and covered sin, but only the perfect sacrifice could take away sin. Only mm -hmm. that person who lived a perfect life and then yeah. died the perfect death could take away sin. Mm. Yeah, Hebrews 10.4 speaks to this. It says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Any animal sacrifice. So yeah. what people had to do, they had to keep making sacrifices, keep animal it. sacrifices. Every time they looking, yeah, yeah, looking ahead to that day when God himself would provide the perfect sacrifice for them. And mm -hmm. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. Gotcha. And that's when it, that's when it changes. Because yeah. that's done, done and done and done yeah it's interesting uh, you know when jesus was hanging on the cross he he, he said some stuff yeah and, and and one of the things he said uh right before he died uh three very simple words john nineteen thirty. he said it is finished yes and in essence he was saying not one more drop of blood needs to be shed my death, Christ's death, has satisfied God's righteous demands. Christ's death has now taken away sin. It's made, a made amends for sin. And because of his death, it's now possible for those who believe and trust in Christ to have eternal life. And that, wow. my brother, yes, is, is why Jesus had to die. So this is this is really big for us as as people as humans because you know we talked about in 1 Corinthians 15:1 and 2 that this message this whole idea concept we're talking about if you believe in it 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 saves you yes right so so this means a lot for us and i think that's what is so cool about this message you know the biblical the scripture that you know this means something for us today this isn't something we're looking back at and saying oh jesus died but because he did that that historical event means something for us extremely long term oh yeah now i want to i want to answer one more question because i've been asked this question what's you know, that the bible says that well jesus died for sin so, so yeah. how do we really know that Christ's death actually satisfied God's demands? Yeah. You know, and anybody can claim. You know, earlier yeah, we talked about how anybody, uh, you know, could could have died for sin, but but how do we know that that Jesus' yeah. death on the cross actually was sufficient to satisfy God? Yeah. What's One, the confirmation? Yeah, one simple word. It, it's not simple. It's cool. Resurrection. Yes. Resurrection. Yes. Hey, hey here's a guy who told people. He said, look, I'm, I'm going to suffer at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders. You know, they're going to nail me to a cross. Mm -hmm. But three days later, I'm going to come back. To life to die no more now yeah. <laughs> what yeah. kind of guy would sit tell people that yeah I mean there's only three possibilities man he was either uh, a liar yeah a lunatic a crazy man crazy yeah sounds crazy oh he was the Lord God man and he could do what he said he was gonna do yeah it's too so yeah yeah be so, so here's the bottom line sense. Anybody who makes that claim and does it, man, I'm going to follow that guy for the rest of my life. Yeah. And he did. He did. Yeah. The resurrection proves that Jesus was 
who he claimed to be, mm -hmm. the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Yeah, and he called it. He called it himself, man. He said he was yeah. going to do it. He did it. Yeah. So here's the gospel. Let's just wrap this up, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the gospel, plain and simple, is this. Jesus, the Savior, is alive. And he gives life to all who believe and trust in him. Yeah. That's the fact, man. That's the truth, whether people believe it or not. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot for us to take there. And I think, um, I think if you're sitting out there and you're hearing all this and you've never heard it before, I, I, I want you guys to reach out with questions because this is really big. Um, this gospel message, this believing in Jesus, this eternal life, this gift that we're talking about is super important. And if you don't know about it and you want to learn more about it, you know, reach out to us. Our emails in down in the description, coffee with Keener at gmail.com. We would love to talk more about this, this, this decision or this, this idea of believing and accepting Jesus and what this gospel means for us today in this world. Cause both of us, we've gone, through a transition where we've accepted that and um, it's changed our lives. And, you know, right, Dr. Keener? Yeah, it's changed my life. See, yeah, what you need to do is you need to take the factual, the historical truth yeah. and make it personal in your life. Yep. So how Absolutely. do you do that? Very simply, you need to understand who Jesus is. We, we've talked about that. What he did for you, specifically what he did for you on the cross, mm -hmm. and then make a personal decision to accept him as Savior and Lord. Uh, yep. Both of those, Savior and Lord. Yep. Uh, and once you make that decision, you begin your lifelong spiritual journey with Jesus. And, and that's really the journey yeah. you and I are on. And yes. uh, like you said, if, if you're not – on that journey, if you're watching us and you're not on that journey, man, mm -hmm. please, please give us a, yeah. a holler on our email. Uh, we would love to, to talk to you about this and, and help you to get on the right path. Absolutely. And I love that you talk about this lifelong because I don't want people to ever think that some people are perfect and, you know, complete. No. You know, we've talked about that before, but this is a lifelong journey. You know, you make a decision to follow Jesus and accept him. But then this is a journey that continues on, like we've talked about, you know, a lot in our episodes. But, yeah, so we just encourage you guys, reach out, questions. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's super cool. And, yeah, we would just love to talk to you about it. Yeah, hey, every journey begins with a first step. Yes, absolutely. And that first step is is getting right with Jesus. Yeah. So, um, and that first step is really hard. It is. For me, me, for myself personally, and, and we're hopefully going to put out an episode about Gary and I's story because we think that's really cool to talk to you guys about. But for me, the first step is really hard. But once you get by that, you kind of get a little bit of momentum and you, you start you start on that journey. And, and that I think that's important. Yeah. But. Cool. Well, hey, man, we are, we're pushing time here. So I think I'll just, I think we'll just push the 13 through 18 to uh, next episode. Um, thir well, let's just touch 13 very quickly, just an overview. Um, 13 just kind of talks about how Paul is on house arrest, but he's still sharing this message, this gospel message we talked about. And maybe we'll come back and hit that a little bit more, but I really just want you guys to walk away with what is this gospel all about? Um, and, and if you don't know about it, want to know more that we're here to, to talk about it, but anytime, cool. man, anytime. Yep. Yes. So we're going to move to deep question of the week. Oh my. Cool. Let me get my phone because this is coming <laughs> in from, let's pull it up here. So from Joey B. Battistelli is what I call him, from <laughs> Ashburn, Virginia. <clears throat> wow. So he wrote, he wrote in, he said, I've thought this many times in the recent past. If God is perfect and all-powerful, almighty, 
why does he allow such good people to experience such awful pain in traumatic situations? So that's Joey B from Ashburn, Virginia writing in. I think basically what he's asking is, you know, why do good people suffer? And yeah, we hear yeah. a lot. And I think it's a great topic to to hit on. So let me pull up my timer here. All take right, a, let me get my take a second brain. To think about it. You know, I gotta get ready to move here because I know I only yeah, got yeah. thirty seconds. All right. All right why so. do good people suffer? All right, ready? Ready? Go. All people. Good, bad, and indifferent suffer because we live in a broken, fallen world. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble. So trouble happens. Suffering happens. It's just part of life here on planet Earth. But in Romans 8.18, this is what Paul says. We're told that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So our future glory, what's in store for us in the future, far outweighs our present sufferings. Boom. Oh, man, he's getting good at this. He's getting good at this. Love it. Man, so you don't know. It takes everything I got, brother, to get this stuff in. I, I, yeah. I got to talk asking, fast. Asking, and Yeah, you're asking a seasoned pastor doctor to talk in only 30 seconds. I'm out of breath. You got to give me. <laughs> He's just going to talk really, really fast just to be able to do it. All right, yeah. so deep question of the week. Thank you, Joey. Again, send that in. Send them in to coffeewithkeener at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Uh, no questions are off, off limits. You know, we want to talk about things that people are thinking about. So send that in. So, Dr. Keener, <laughs> any, uh, any uh, jokes for us this week? Yeah, I got another dad joke for you. I, I want to get off the hippie thing. Yeah, so, uh, okay. something more uh, relevant. That's happening okay. today. You know, the hippie yeah, stuff yeah. was back in the day. Not this oh, yeah. is not flash forward. Yeah, this is real stuff that's going on today with all of us. As you know, we we're being encouraged to to order takeout from local restaurants, right? Yeah. And uh, so the other night, Carol and I did just that. Actually, we ordered Pelican. Pelican. I don't even know what that is, but you know, how was it? The bird, yeah, it, it's, how was it? Yeah. It was pretty good, but yeah. man, the bill was huge. <laughs> you know that, the bit, the beat? The... I, I know, oh my goodness. I don't know what to do with these dad jokes, but I hope you're enjoying them. Again, thanks for joining us, Cop with Keener. Uh, the gospel message is a big deal, guys, and, and we're excited that we were able to share it with you. And uh, until next episode, uh, we will see you guys later, all right? All right, peace, peace out. Peace. All right, catch you guys. All right.